Today I'm so excited. Reg, or um, I'm sorry, Eric Dawson is my guest, and Eric I met at the farm, a farm event the other day. So Eric grew up outside of Boston, Massachusetts, graduated from Connecticut College in 2019 with a degree in environmental studies and international relations. Eric became interested in regenerative agriculture when he was introduced to the school's campus garden sprout. Sprout is capital letters, probably an acronym, we have to find out. And he started in freshman year doing that. Eric has experience in farm-based education, farm management, from his prior work at Spout, Sprout and Green City Growers, an urban agricultural company based in Somerville, Massachusetts. His favorite things to grow are carrots, lettuce, eggplant, and meals to cook that have um, eggplant in them, like eggplant parmesan. It reminds him of his community dinners at Sprout. He's looking forward to teaching more people about where their food comes and from and creating some tasty recipes in the process. Eric can be found gardening at home, snowboarding, longboarding, kayaking, or playing guitar. So Eric, welcome. So glad that you could come. And it was so nice to meet you the other day at that event that, that was going on. So currently you're, you're at the Yellow Farmhouse Education Center. So the Correct, Yellow yeah. Farmhouse, there was just like a little yellow house and then there's the farm, right? Or yeah, so it's kind of complicated. So Stone Acres Farm, um, located in Stonington, Connecticut. Um, all of the buildings on there are yellow, so technically any of them could be the yellow farmhouse. But we're located right across from the farm stand. Um, and the mission of the yellow farmhouse, what we do there, um, our mission is to connect people to where their um, people to each other and to where their food comes from through culinary and farm-based education. And we do that through a multiple uh, multiple of different ways. So we host kids programs throughout the summer um, for all ages, from like preschool up to um, elementary school. Um, in the fall and in the springtime during the school year, we host um, field trips on the farm. Um, so students from all different schools will be able to come explore the farm, um, get to do some work, so get their hands dirty, and then also try to um, cook something with some like seasonal ingredients that they would have harvested that day. We have a summer internship program for high school seniors or rising high school seniors. And we're also hosting, um, just got some cool grant money, so we're gonna be hosting a series of professional development workshops for culinary teachers across the state um, starting this year and going all the way into next year. So we do a lot of stuff. Um, and yeah, we also have a little farm that we run there as well. Very nice, very yeah. nice. And what great work you're doing. Yeah. And why is that important, Eric? I mean, you know, from your perspective, I mean, I have my opinion and I'd love to hear what you think. Why is that important for people to know where their food comes from. I mean, yeah. isn't it enough, enough just to see it at the fast food restaurant or at the grocery store? Isn't that enough? Uh, so there's so many, so <laughs> many reasons why it's like important to know where your food comes from. Um, so yeah. a lot of people, when they think of food, they think of going to the grocery store, picking out things that like tomatoes, mangoes, pineapple, all these sort of like um, tropical things that and if we see them in the grocery store, we sort of assume that they're available to us year round. Um, but that's not really the case. That's not um, true, yeah. Um, so a lot of what we focus at the Yellow Farmhouse is um, teaching about seasonal ingredients. So when you know where your food comes from and also um, like what time of year it's able to be grown, that'll help you choose more seasonably um, in terms of what you're eating. And there are a lot of benefits for that. Tell me. Um, so for starters, when you're eating, season um, se eating seasonally, excuse me, um, Basically what you're going to be doing is you're getting all of the nutrients from the plants that are ripe when they're supposed to be ripe. So if you get a tomato from the grocery store, for example, that was picked when it was still green. It was brought from thousands of miles away in the back of a truck getting sprayed with hormones to ripen up, um, to ripen it up quicker um, in that process. And then by the time it gets to the grocery store, you have this like beautiful red tomato, but when it was picked, it was still unripe. So it didn't have all of the nutrients um, that are important for you. So by like picking things seasonally when they're ripe and when they're ready for you, you're gonna have like the most nutrients in them um, and also reduces the food miles. So the amount of time and like carbon resources that go into um, transporting food, whether it's by boats, planes, trains, whatever, um, getting that from point A to point B, especially if it's like thousands of miles from like South America, like places like that. Um, that has a major carbon impact. Of um, course. So, well, yeah. and you know, the, the other thing, I think that's really interesting along that same line, I, I told you previously that I grew up in Nebraska. Yeah. And then my husband and I, shortly after we got married, we moved to Utah. 
And in Nebraska, we already talked about how there's a lot of corn, there's a lot of wheat, sorghum, uh, grains, things yeah. like that. But in Utah, there's more orchards. And so yeah. I was so blown away by how delicious the fruit was in Utah. And I'd never tasted such a juicy sweet peach before because fresh it was yeah fresh yeah. yeah fresh off of the tree kind of thing, yeah. yeah so just to your point, uh, like I think in general like if it's fresh off the plant it's always going to taste better. So when we have like kids over the summer and just like when we have um, field trip groups coming through um, like cherry tomatoes are a great example like. A lot of kids, when they get cherry tomatoes from the grocery store, they don't really like them that much. They mm -hmm. don't like taste like anything. It's mm -hmm. a weird texture. But mm -hmm. when we come to the farm, they're able to pick a cherry tomato like right from the f uh, like right from the plant. Are they like, afraid to do it at first? Oh, sometimes they are, but I always like to demonstrate. So I'll just when we have like a group of kids coming through, like no matter what it is, I'll usually just like rip a leaf off or rip um, like one of the fruits off and just like put it right in my mouth as I'm talking to them. So they see that like, hey, this is just a this is just food like we're supposed to be able to eat it. And then once they see me, that's like, hey, you can eat these things. They get more confident doing it. And then they're really excited just to be able to harvest something themselves, rip it off the plant and just like just eat it from there and it always tastes better for them from the fact that they've picked it themselves and the fact that it's ripe when they're picking it. Well, and the ownership part of it too. Exactly. I know just like yeah. when you plant a seed and then you see the little seedling and then it yeah. grows into this enormous like tomato <laughs> plant kind of thing. And the, the tomato seeds are just so tiny too to yeah. begin with and the potential is just so amazing. It always boggles my mind like how like cabbage and like broccoli and like the things in the brassica family like kale those sorts of stuff the seeds for those are so tiny it's like size of a pinhead yet they turn into these like monstrous plants and it's just so much respect for those tiny little seeds absolutely absolutely and the potential is just so huge yep. so that's beautiful do you have any stories with kids like you know that that came through and that were just kind of almost awestruck yeah. by the experience i think a lot of the stories that I'd have more just like relate to kids just like trying something new and just like that excitement that they have when something that is not really anything that they've like seen before would like normally eat themselves. They get to taste it and just, it's sort of just like a little shock and awe effect on their faces. I love like, that. It's, it's really cool. <laughs> that it's really is, cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's great. And like the tomatoes, cucumbers are always a good example. Um, last year we had this plant um, called uh, Mexican sour gherkin, or sometimes known as, as a mouse melon. Uh, these tiny little cucumbers, maybe about this big, and they shape like little watermelons, and they have like the same little watermelon pattern. Mm -hmm. um, so. We'd pluck those with the kids, and they'd just like be popping them all in their mouth all the time. Just, nice. Like, absolutely delicious. Instead of potato chips, huh? Yeah, instead of potato chips, little little mouse melons, little <laughs> melons, and perfect snack for a hot summer day. That's great. And when I met you at the yellow, yellow I, I, farmhouse, the yellow. When I met yeah. you at the yellow farmhouse, you were serving an appetizer, and there were a couple of them that were out there. Do you remember those? And they were just so tasty. Yeah. And it was like local cheese, I believe, with maybe a, a drizzle of olive oil on top, and then... Yeah, let's see. So we made, um, so myself and a couple of the interns that we had this summer, we made some cu uh, cucumber pickles from uh, cucumbers that were grown in the micro farm. Um, we grew, had some like skewers with some cherry tomatoes from the farm and some local feta cheese. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also had um, these sort of little toasts um, mm. with some seacoast mushrooms, which is a, another local mushroom company, um, and some more mystic cheese on there as well. It so. was just all so delicious yeah. and so beautifully presented and so well done. So yeah, and the you. food was just amazing. So, yeah. So the program, how did you get started in this industry of, you know, you call yourself an educator and a farmer. How did you become a farmer? Because you don't look like a farmer. <laughs> no, I sort of got into agriculture by accident. Mm -hmm. um, so my freshman year at college, at Connecticut College, um, I was initially working with the Office of Sustainability um, and their land management team trying to relocate the campus farm Sprout um, to a bigger location somewhere else on campus. 
Um, so my freshman year, I've been working with that. And then the two leaders of that team graduated. So I was just the lone remainder, lone person on that team. So I was told, hey, you should go sit in on one of the Sprout meetings um, to see what they're doing and like what their opinion on this is and how we can work together. There was a little bit of a miscommunication there. So I was told that I was just going to sit in for a meeting. They were told that I was going to be one of the new managers. <laughs> um, so when we got there, we were both like a little surprised. Um, but yeah, it turned out great. Like everyone who worked at Sprout at the time was just like super kind um, and very welcoming. And they also had a lot of knowledge and were really like excited about teaching people about that. Mm -hmm. um, so working through Sprout and just like the people around there and then just like all the knowledge sharing that was happening really got me excited about agriculture. Um, and I was already studying environmental science. So I was learning more about like the negative impacts of like food production um, and like the different ways that we're hurting our planet. So learning more about agriculture and sort of like the negative side effects of it in my classes um, that really sort of like sparked that passion. And then the education portion sort of came a little bit later. Um, we'd done like different workshops and stuff with Sprout for students. Um, so we had like a little bit, I had a little bit of experience with that. Um, and then after I graduated, I started working at this company called Green City Growers in Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, and it was there that I really got like more into the education field. Um, so teaching classes um, during the school year for kids in their school gardens outside over the winter time. Um, we, uh, Green City Growers would build indoor grow stations with like grow lights and irrigation and everything. So we'd do more um, like growing and stuff during the winter. So I was working with those kids during the winter time. Um, and then, yeah, I really just enjoy talking with kids and like seeing them get excited about plants um, and just like food in general. So once I found out that I like those two things, like agriculture and education, like Yellow Farmhouse is like sort of that perfect mix of both of them. So nice, nice. Really happy to be here. Nice. So and have you been there then for about a year and a half or? Yes, yeah. going on about like year, year and a third, year and a half right now. Nice, yeah. very nice. So definitely getting getting your feet well planted in that environment. For sure. So that's yep. lovely. Yeah. yeah. So do you have a curriculum that you have that it's been established or do you just how does that go? How does that work? Yeah, so for the summer programs, um, we've definitely like created a curriculum for this year. So figured out what works, what doesn't work, and we'll be able to repeat what yeah repeat what does work and like make changes for next year. Um, we do have like a general like format for how we run um, our program. So for our field trips, like depending on like how much time a school has, um, like our longest ones will be like a three hour field trip, um, and that will be like. The kids will arrive at the farm, they'll get a tour of everything that we have growing, uh, that we have going on there. Um, they'll be able to get to work in the field, so whether that's harvesting something, planting something, and then we'll usually finish up um, with a culinary portion. So bring that connection of like where the food comes from to like actually using it. Um, we finish usually finish up with that with a recipe um, that all the kids will get to participate in cooking. Um, Usually something quick like a snack, but we've we've gone like more in depth with more like meals. Very nice. Yeah. And how old are the kids? It really ranges. So we've had preschool kids um, up to like high school classes. Nice. Um, and yeah, we had last year um, during the fall we had a couple interns from Johnston and Wales um, who came and helped out. Um, for a couple months over there. So pretty much from like preschool to college age, we interact with. So are you looking for volunteers? Are you looking to have that expanded through people getting their hands yeah. in the dirt as well? Or <laughs> I think so. So part of like what we would want volunteers for right now is um, our new gleaning network. So we started this program called Preserving the Bounty um, at the beginning of this growing season. Um, so basically what Preserving the Bounty is, is we've created this gleaning network with local partner farms in the area. Um, so like Huntsbrook Farm, Provider Farm, the Connecticut College Sprout Garden, um, and a few others um, are all part of this network. So basically whenever there's excess produce that they, um, that those farms either can't um, sell in their farmers markets or can't get to market um, or if there's not enough in the field for it to make sense for the farmers to go out and harvest it themselves um, we would have like it's mostly just been myself and the interns if you have a volunteer network that would be great um, to be able to go and pick up um, either pick up the produce or harvest it directly from those fields themselves 
Um, and then from there, it would get brought over to be partnered with the New London Community Meal Center as our primary um, donation spot, um, as well as the Johnny Cake Center in Westerly. Um, basically, from there, all of that produce would go to those two locations um, to be served either fresh in the meal kitchen, um, at the meal center's kitchen um, for hot meals there, um, or when it goes to the Johnny Cake Center, they have a food pantry over there, so it would get donated over there. Um, so, yeah, for anyone who wants it. Very nice. Yeah. You know, and I'm on the board for the New London yes. Community Meal Center. Yeah. So, and we certainly appreciate it. And I also volunteer there. So I'm I'll there. I'll see you around sometime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm there chopping the vegetables and scrubbing yeah. things and getting them ready. And the recipients of our services, I have to tell you, are just so grateful for those contributions and the hard work that goes in and the harvesting yeah. and the whole process that goes and it does it just tastes so much better because it is locally grown and it, just it's all it's gonna yeah. taste better every time yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah it's just yeah. amazing so and we learn every day when we we're in the kitchen too about meal preparation and how to make it make it tasty so yeah that's beautiful so, and you talked a little bit about regenerative uh, farming um what is what is that Yes. Um, so regenerative farming is, in general, it's the term is rather new, but the practices themselves aren't. So regenerative farming is sort of just like you can think of it as like a new, like a rebranding of sort of like indigenous um, farming practices. So like some things that regenerative agriculture tries to focus on is soil protection. Um, so soil is our most important resource that we have on the farm. So making sure that we protect that um, by whatever means necessary is critical. Um, so soil protection is going to be the main thing um, that regenerative agriculture focuses on. Um, and how do you protect your soil? I mean, like, what are like two or three things that you'd need to do to keep your soil healthy? Yeah, so making sure that it's bare as little as possible. So we use cover crops on our farm. Um, so those are just plants that will, um, you basically put uh, seed them when the, um, yeah, when the ground is fallow, so there's nothing growing in there. Those will um, grow up and basically help prevent erosion, so from wind and rain and stuff from blowing and washing the soil away. What are some roots. examples of cover crop then? Yeah. Um, so oats and peas is a good combin is a pretty common combination. Um, there's also a combo of this plant called hairy vetch and ryegrass. Um, so between both of those combinations, um, the plant's roots are going to help prevent erosion, so keep that soil from washing away, and they're also going to add nutrients to the soil. Um, nice. Specifically with the oats and peas, it's going to add nitrogen to it. Um, the oats are a legume, or excuse me, the peas are a legume, so they're going to add that nitrogen, and that basically just, nitrogen is what makes plants green. So mm. having nitrogen in the soil is important, um, but we also don't want to have too much because that can lead to runoff. So the cover crops help um, prevent erosion, they can add some nutrients, and they can also absorb like excess nutrients and stuff from leaching away from the soil and into waterways, which can lead to Nice, nice, things. nice, yeah. So you keep the soil healthy, yeah. and then you you rotate the crops, I would imagine, as well? Yeah, we rotate stuff so we don't have the same plants taking the same nutrients from the same patch of soil year after year. Mm -hmm. um, so it might be like tomatoes, which are a heavy feeder, which need like a lot of nutrients, and then something like lettuce, um, which doesn't need as much nutrients um, afterwards. So you have like a heavy um, cycle and then a light cycle, so giving the soil time to uh, replenish itself. Oh, interesting. Oh, no. Okay, very good. And then do you do companion gardening too, where you have certain things together? Yeah, um, so on the Stone Acre side itself, not as much, um, but in the micro farm where I work, um, we it's a smaller plot and it's more experimental, so we can try a lot more of those things. So tomatoes and basil is a pretty common one. The basil helps um, make the tomatoes taste a little bit better. And then just some other ones that I'm trying to mess around with, um, seeing if I can like save space. So oh, um, I'm trying like mm -hmm. growing peas, um, sugar snap peas in the fall with like kale on each side of it. So the peas will grow up in the center and then the kale will grow up on either side of the row. Hopefully wow. those won't end up like shading each other out. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you don't know. We'll yeah, out. you try and, you, yeah. know, that's, you, you know, you learn, right? It's, yeah, and like the micro farm is a great spot for that because we do grow a lot. Everything that we grow there is for donation, um, but it's also an educational garden. So mm. it does give us a lot of space to be able to experiment and like test out these, um, yeah, these different types of growing. Oh, it's so interesting. And um, what is your opinion on um, aquaponics and hydroponics? I think it's really cool, um, specifically in like urban settings where it can be vertically integrated. Um, like, 
finding a plot of land in a city is impossible, but right. finding like a shipping container or something like or an old warehouse or something where you could set up a hydroponic or aquaponic system, um, you're still able to grow like all of that food and it requires so much less space. So I'm a big fan of it. You're able to grow more food for people in areas where you wouldn't normally be able to grow food. So. I don't see anything wrong with that. Nice. And it's getting more efficient in terms of like electricity use and like water use and all that. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are there, good. are you aware of any hydroponic or aquaponic uh, farm or agriculture going on locally? Um, Not like super locally. The biggest example would probably be Gotham Greens and I think it's in Providence and then they have another location in Brooklyn, um, which is these massive- Brooklyn, uh, New York, not Brooklyn, Connecticut. Yeah, Brooklyn, New York. Right. Um, yeah, these like massive greenhouses where they're growing just like a ton of different um, aquaponic or yeah, hydroponic greens mm. and stuff with lots of head lettuce and all mm. that. Mm. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, you have the fish too, which sometimes, yeah. and that can be also used in the meals and the preparation, but I guess it's a little more low value. Uh, yeah, I feel like, I'm, I don't know for sure, but I feel like they use like tilapia a lot right. for like sort of aquaponics right. um, and, that, and that sort of stuff, but I'm not, I'm not an expert on that by any means. That's not your field, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, the plans for going forward with the uh, button, with the yellow f farmhouse, what are, what are some big long-term things that you guys have going that you're thinking about doing? Yeah, um, so from my standpoint, like the Preserving the Bounty Gleaning Network and seeing how far we can take that, mm -hmm. um, so ideally, um, we're gonna keep growing. Like this year is really just a pilot to see how much we can, like how much we can actually like take, or how much we can actually glean. So we're excited to see where that can take us. Um, and also um, our teacher professional development programs. Um, so we started, we got like a grant for those. So we'll be able to have um, about 12 workshops. So once that, one every month, um, some are gonna be virtual, some are gonna be in person. Um, and also um, with that, we're gonna be starting a website with a lot of our curriculum um, for FCS teachers, so family and consumer science teachers in Connecticut. So what used to be called Home Act is now family and consumer science. So a lot of the culinary teachers working more with them, um, providing more resources for them on our soon to be website. I think nice, very nice, very nice. Towards. So anybody in the area can avail themselves to these services that you're providing, is that true? How does that work? Yeah, so with the professional development um, for like uh, for culinary teachers or just teachers in general, um, that all of that information can be found on our website if you just go to yellowfarmhouse.org. Um, yeah, and then for the rest of our yeah, the website will be available to everyone once that's up and running. Um, the gleaning network is not like not really designed to be like. For the public, but um, no, that would yeah, be more for like the volunteer stuff. Sites, yeah. right? Okay, because I'm also yeah. on the board of education in East oh, okay. Lyme, so I'm just thinking for my school system the, gotcha. and, yeah. and different opportunities that we could make available. So we offer our field trips to anyone who, yeah, anyone who's interested. Um, mm -hmm. So during the spring and fall. Um, yeah, we can try to book some of those in as well. Okay, okay. I think that would be just a great opportunity for Absolutely, people to come yeah. and to see what you're up to and, and to have that experience. Sometimes kids have never even been on a farm. Are there animals that you have on the farm as well? Yeah, so we have um, chickens and turkeys this year. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a flock of laying hens, uh, I think about like 40 or 50, and then there are broiler hens, so raised for meat. Um, and I think we're on our fourth. Uh, flock of those so far and then we have turkeys that we're hopefully going to raise for Thanksgiving this year. Oh, oh gee, wouldn't yeah. that be nice to kind of get to meet your turkey <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> that you're going to be eating on Thanksgiving yeah. and, and do you find that some people because they get so close to the work in the farm that they become vegans or vegetarians or? I I think so. I haven't like met anyone personally yet but I've definitely heard stories about that. Like, mm -hmm. If it's, like we work more with um, plants compared to animals, but I imagine like livestock farmers, it must be kind of tricky for them to like, you work with these animals all the time. Like you learn about them, you like see their personalities come into play. But at the end of the day, it's just 
it's all this part of nature and part of farming. So exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. So, did you grow up like interested in farming at all? Did you have like a little plot up outside of Boston where you were living as a kid growing up? So we had um, along like the side of my driveway, we had this like maybe two foot by like eight foot little plot that got like very little sun. Me and my dad tried growing like tomatoes and cucumbers um, for a couple years when I was in elementary school. Um, so when I was a kid, that was pretty much like the extent of my gardening experience. I would just like pull weeds from the yard and like pull weeds from like other like planter beds around. And like as a kid, that's no fun to do. But no, no. once you get into like college and like see what agriculture can actually be, then like then it gets exciting. So being able to have kids come to the yellow farmhouse and come to Stone Acres and like see what an actual farm is from a young age is just like it's really exciting. For that's me. very exciting. Yeah. What about your mom? Did she have house plants or? No, not really. No, not really. No, just <laughs> you know, we had a we had a yard, and I would just like I'd pull crab grass from there every once in a while mm -hmm. with my dad. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that was the extent of it, pretty much. Mm, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So are there some good resources, books people should read? Like, how can they find out more besides just going to your website? Are, are there some um, authors that you would suggest? Or yeah. So in terms of like food, um, I'd recommend like pretty much anything by Michael Pollan. Um, he's written Botany of Desire and a couple other. Um, Botany of Desire, Pollan. How do you spell Pollan? P O L L I N. Or a N. I believe. P O L L A N. Michael Pollan. Bot yeah. Botany oh. of Desire. I want to read that. Yeah, that's a pretty interesting one. Sort of how like plants have sort of like we think we've manipulated plants, but plants have also sort of like manipulated us in a way, which is pretty fascinating. <laughs> we have this relationship yeah. going, huh? Um, and then more on like the agriculture side um i'd recommend farming while black by leah peniman um mm -hmm. is a really good book um so i've been trying to like dive deeper into that one farming yeah. while yeah farming while black black yeah. wow yeah. interesting yeah it's about um leah peniman uh in this farm and blanking and where in new york but somewhere in upstate new york um called soul fire farm um so big into the regenerative agriculture um and more of like the social justice and like food justice aspect of agriculture as well um, oh so, so interesting. if you're interested in that i would recommend that book. okay wow yeah. well a couple of good ideas books yeah. to read and a resource of a website to go to and anything else that you would like to share as far as pearls of wisdom and why this is important um Let's see, something I just like to say for myself, just plant more seeds. So whether that means planting more seeds of physical plants, just planting ideas in people's heads, just plant more seeds. Plant more seeds, I like that. Yeah. Is that your mantra then? Yeah, a little bit, I'd uh, say so. A little bit, yeah. yeah. And we can, I mean, you know, we're going into fall, so we think of fall as harvest, but there are some fall things that you can probably start planting right now, right? Oh, yeah, there's there's a ton of stuff. Um, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be putting a lot of my fall crops into the micro farm soon, so. Okay. Okay, so yeah. what are some examples? Spinach, kale, cabbage, anything in like the brassica family. Lettuces will like this cooler weather for the next couple months, so you'll have good success with those. Radishes, carrots, beets. Um, most things except like cucumbers, peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, those sorts of things will do pretty well in like the next like month or so. And then once winter comes around, you'll really only be able to grow like spinach, carrots, kale, maybe some cabbage and whatnot in there. Well, Eric, thank you so much for being my guest today. No we're, all, we're all a little smarter after hearing <laughs> what you have to say. So thank you for sharing your wisdom oh, and your knowledge. Thank you so much for having me. My really pleasure. appreciate it.